This week's episode is brought to you by Star Wars The Force Awakens novelization by Alan Dean Foster, who also happened to write the novelization of Star Wars back in 1977. Now we know you. Hello and welcome to Communicore Weekly, the greatest online show and home of the world's first pair of independently born identical twins. I'm George. And I'm Jeff. And before we get into the actual episode, we just wanted to thank you for all the outpouring of support and love that we got from you guys the last couple of days after our announcement that we're ending after this season. We got a lot of emails and, and tweets and text messages and everything, and it was just, it was good. It made, me, it made us feel good. Yeah, but no candy. No, no candy. I mean, I figured we get candy or roses or... Isn't that something that you do or... I don't know. I don't know, is it? I don't know the proper etiquette for a podcast ending. I mean, maybe other podcasts get candy and roses when they are going to be done well, in a year. Maybe we get it at oh, the end of the year. That's That maybe that's what it is. But shouldn't we get something like pre-candy? What do you, what do you mean? I like buy- candy to... It's like an appetizer. So you, you get know, like you one can- M&M for you at the whole bag? <laughs> Sure. It's kind of like a kidnapping. Like here, here's the finger. Here's the finger. Here's the M M&M. and M. We'll give you this much. But I mean, I, yeah, I guess we gave everybody some warning. Most podcasts sort of fade away, and you don't know what happened to it. That's true. They just disappear into the ether of yeah. Disney fandom, or the aether, which is that red stuff from Thor: The Dark World. Look at you tying it back. Hey, tying it back. Hey. I mean, we got to get the street credibility somehow. I, it's not from that. It's oh. definitely not from that. But oh. we know where we can get some street cred. I thought she'd say some street candy. Or candy, probably, in our history segment. Let's do that. It's time for the Park History! Busch Gardens Williamsburg opened on May 16th, 1975, and was the fourth park opened by the Anheuser-Busch Company. Not counting the original Busch Gardens Park in Pasadena that operated from uh, 1905 to 1937, since you know it wasn't attached to a brewery and was more of a garden space. But regardless, that Pasadena, Pasadena Park, it still offered a, a nice template that would be used for the rest of the parks that uh, Busch Gardens would open. And you know, make sure to check out episode 205 to learn more about Busch Garden Parks in California and Texas, and pretty much overall. Yeah, so Busch Gardens Williamsburg today is one of 11 properties managed by SeaWorld Entertainment. And the 1970s was a heyday for theme parks and roller coasters. Kings Island, Six Flags St. Louis, Marriott's Great America Parks in Chicago and San Francisco, Magic Mountain in California, and Great Adventure in New Jersey were just a few of the larger theme parks that opened during the decade. And coasters by John Allen of the Philadelphia Toboggan Company helped kick off the coaster revolution while companies like Arrow and Schwarzkopf brought steel and loops into the equation. So Anheuser-Busch kind of found a semi-successful pattern with adding bird shows because everybody loves bird shows. Um, <laughs> beer gardens, because, you know, beer. Everybody likes growing beer? Of, yeah, of course, of course. Okay, okay. And, of course, brewery tours, because everyone wants to know how to make their own beer, um, to some of its major breweries across the country. The Williamsburg Brewery actually opened in 1972 and was part of a larger property acquisition that had taken place a few years before. And when researching the history of the area, we were both kind of we were both kind of surprised at the the scope of the original project and the similarities to some of the developments of Walt Disney World, sort of, kind of. Yeah. So the story of the area goes back to well, 1607 <laughs> with the founding of the first permanent English settlement. In Jamestown. What was that like, George? <laughs> well, the Swambo time machine. Well, anyway, so <laughs> <laughs> we're uh, we're not going to 
go that far back, but the, the specific area that we're talking about is the Kings Mill area in James City County, Virginia. And, you know, not to get too technical, but the Virginia Company was a land-grant organization founded by James I in England, and Richard Kings Mill was given a land grant of 300 acres. He called it the Kings Mill Plantation. Uh, British Colonel Lewis Burrell III added about 1,400 acres in the 1730s and continued with the name of Kings Mill Plantation. Now, the area of King's Plantation was close to Williamsburg, which was settled in the 17th century and was a fortified settlement known as the Middle Plantation. Now, oddly enough, the area, because it wasn't located near a waterway, uh, it seemed to have time in the world kind of sort of pass it by. Now, we know this is a kind of a simpli simplification, but this will come into play later. So, in the 20th century, most of the land of the Kingsmill Plantation was acquired by Colonial Williamsburg, which is a private foundation and a living history museum. Colonial Williamsburg is a 301-acre historic area that represents the 18th century uh, when the city was the capital of Colonial Virginia. Colonial Williamsburg was championed by the Rever Reverend Dr. W.A.R. Goodwin and many other community groups and leaders, including John D. Rockefeller of Rockefeller Oil and his wife, Abby, and their son, Winthrop Rockefeller, became the chairman of Colonial Williamsburg when he was also governor of Arkansas in the 1960s. And at the same time, Winthrop heard that Augustus Bush II, who was president of Anheuser-Busch at the time, was interested in developing a brewery and uh, quote-unquote other activities in the area. So that much sounds, room for activities. Yeah, sounds a little bit different, but uh, so Winthrop negotiated a deal that allowed the land of the Kings Mill Plantation to be purchased. So this allowed the Anheuser-Busch uh, to develop several properties. The Kings Mill Resort, uh, Kings Mill on the James, Commercial Parks, and Bush Gardens Williamsburg. Now, the Kings Mill Resort is a 425-room golf resort that also has a conference center, uh, a marina, and also a tennis center. And when Anheuser-Busch was purchased by InBev uh, in 2008 and the Blackstone Group acquired the theme parks, the Kings Mill Resort was sold to Zantera, which kind of sounds like an awesome 80s uh, hair metal band, but it isn't, unfortunately. <laughs> So Kings Mill on the James is a planned community, and it stretches three miles along the James River. The neighborhood is a gated community, community that's part of the 2,900-acre development. It has its own police force and a community board that at one point was sort of ruled by Anheuser-Busch until the InBev purchase. Also, there was the Quarterlands Commons Commercial Park that was part of the plan and was developed into McLaw Circle, a Bush business park. So basically all that is a lot of backstory, just to bring us <laughs> up to the opening of uh, Bush Gardens Williamsburg in 1975. But, you know, it's interesting to see how the development changed based on the history and the players that were involved. And unlike Tampa, the Williamsburg property would be open as a full-fledged uh, theme park that offered tours of the brewery. So the park was originally called the Old Country Bush Gardens Williamsburg and had a theme that focused on European countries. When the park opened, there were six hamlets themed to very specific countries and time periods. Banbury Cross in England is the entrance to the park and is themed like we've just entered Shakespeare's time with Elizabethan shops and cobblestones. The area also featured a petting zoo and the reproduction of the Globe Theater. Next up was Hastings in England, which featured more of a medieval theme. There was also an indoor dark ride called the Catapult, with a K, which was themed on the Battle of Hastings. And it's also where the monorail, Eagle One, would depart for the brewery tour, because that makes sense. Makes right? tons of sense to me. <laughs> okay, okay. So Heather Downs had a Scottish theme, and it's also where the Clydesdale horses lived. And you can also depart uh, on the European-style Grand Steam Train or on the Aeronaut uh, Skyride. Now, Aquitaine is themed like an 1800s French village, and you can stroll through the open-air marketplace with artists or, you know, take in the famous Anheuser-Busch Bird Circus at the outdoor uh, amphitheater. Or pretend you're Belle and just read a book and ignore <laughs> everything. Whatever you want to do. Um, you could also race in the Le Mans, Le Mans replica race car. And then next up was New France. Um, it was actually based on French Canadian outpost, and you kind of strolled through a heavily wooded area with a fur trapper's outpost, uh, cabins, and a lot of pioneer crafts. And there was also the Le Scoot log flume that ended in sawmills. Because all great log flumes end in a sawmill. Yes. So or, the, or begin in one. 
Or beginning one, yeah, that's true. Yeah, good point. The last Hamlet during opening was Rheinfeld in Germany. Set in the 19th century, you can enjoy the Oompa bands at the Wilkemann House, as well as the antique carousel ride, and the park's first coaster, a Schwarzkopf steel coaster, the Glissade, was in this section. And Grimm's Hollow, a children's area, was here. And that kind of sounds like a scary place Jeff would like to I, I love it already. Yeah, okay, so, so now let's take a pretty quick look at the next 40 years of the old country. So in 1976, Oktoberfest opened, and the main feature was the Faust House, uh, the, the Fast House, uh, mm-hmm. modeled after the music halls in Munich. And Oktoberfest is themed around the time of King Louis the, uh, the First of Bavaria. And there were also a lot of flat rides added to the area, like the swings and the bumper cars. And they also added some festival games and Die Wildercats, right? <laughs> Boom. <That's it. laughs> uh, a wildcat steel coaster. Um, 1970 brought Nessie to the Heather Downs Hamlet. So this, the Loch Ness uh, Monster Steel Coaster by Arrow cost $1 million and was one of the first roller coasters I ever went on. Yeah, me too, me too. So San Marco, Italy is added in 1980, and San Marco would be stylized after the Mediterranean area and offer gardens and, and, and some few animals, like in a petting, air, petting zoo. And there would also be the 1,000-seat La Piazza Open Air Theater. And over the next few years, they would add the Battering Ram, which was a pirate ship, and Da Vinci's Cradle, which was a flying carpet ride. And in 1983, the Wildcats would be mo- removed for the addition of the Big Bad Wolf coaster in 1984. I love that roller coaster. And it was an aero-suspended steel coaster that cost $5 million. Fiesta Italia was added in 1987 and is themed around a fair celebrating Marco Polo's return from China. Wait a minute. Is that all for that? Uh, I'm just waiting, waiting for you to say it. Oh, okay. Oh, Marco Polo. <laughs> um, anyway, the Roman Rapids and the Gladiator's Gauntlet were added in 1988. In 1992, the park is simply known as Busch Gardens Williamsburg, and the old country part of the name is dropped. They also add uh, Dragon Fire, a steel loping, uh, looping coaster from Arrow. And in 1994, Grimm's Hollow, the section for children that I would have loved, is replaced with Land of the Dragons, which is, I guess, still yeah, pretty cool. Yeah, you'd still like it. Yeah, yeah sure, why not? Yeah. In 1995, Escape from Pompeii, uh, Shoot the Shoots ride is added. Okay, in 1996, Anheuser-Busch was the sponsor of the Olympics, and they opened a steel wild mouse coaster called the Wild Izzy, because, again, this makes sense. Um, the coaster would be moved to Busch Gardens, Tampa, and is now known as the Sand Serpent. And speaking of coasters... Alpengeist, a Bollinger and Mabillard inverted coaster, is added in 1997. Love that one, too. And Drakenfire closed in 1998 due to numerous complaints, and it would stay closed for another three and a half years. Apollo's Chariot opened in 1999, and it's a hyper coaster from BMM. BNM. Uh, if you remember from our roller coaster episode, that means that the lift hill or the drop is over 200 feet. Uh, also, during the media event for Apo- Apollo's Chariot, Fabio, who, as you know, is a frequent listener of Communicore <laughs> Weekly, um, was hit in the face by a goose, which was a big deal at the time. And yes. instead of seeking damages, he just simply asked for a net under the coaster to stop it from actually happening again. And also, Fabio is never invited to another coaster opening ever, as far as we can tell. Also, he can't believe it's not <laughs> butter. So in 2000, Jack Hanna's Wild Reserve is added. This area houses various birds, including bald eagles, and it's also the home of wolves. Uh, Killarney, Ireland, replaced the Hastings area of England in 2001. And this area then becomes home to the Eagle Ridge and Wolf Valley of Jack Hanna's Wild Reserve. And, you know, I mentioned, <clears throat> excuse me, that it also has uh, the Europe in the Air attraction, which is a motion simulator taking you through the sights of Europe. So I'm thinking it's a little bit like Soren, meaning Jeff probably doesn't like it. More than likely. More than likely. Um, the Curse of Dark Castle was added in 2005, which is very, very similar to the Spider-Man attraction and Transformers at Universal. Um, Griffin, a floorless dive coaster from B&M, opened in 2007 and stole the records for the tallest and fastest dive coaster from Shakira, right? Shikra. Shikra, whatever. Yeah. Shakira <laughs> uh, at Busch Gardens, Tampa. Griffin also happens to be one of George's favorite coasters in the entire Yay. world. We all know. Yes, yes. Uh, anyway. Grover's Alpine Express opened in 2009, along with the Sesame Street Fars of Fun, not really as cool as Grimm's Hollow, I'm not going to lie. <laughs> 
The area also includes Bert and Ernie's Lock Adventure and Oscar's Whirly Worms. And we should also mention that Busch Gardens Williamsburg became Busch Gardens Europe from 2006 to 2008. So just like Busch Gardens Tampa, it took a long time to get a name. Yep. So, um, you know, as we've covered before, Anheuser-Busch was purchased by InBev in 2009, and then the parks were sold to the Blackstone Group, which formed SeaWorld Parks and Entertainment. And at that point, the famous Clydesdale horses were removed, and the Highland Stables are now used for sheep, border collies, and a barn owl. And Big Bad Wolf closed in 2009 and was play, replaced in 2012 with Verbolten, a multi-launching steel coaster built by Zier. And if you've never ridden it, it's got some surprises. And then Tempesto, a steel coaster built by Premier Rides, opened in 2015 as the park celebrated its 40th anniversary. So, Busch Gardens Williamsburg is considered one of the world's most beautiful parks and has won the Golden Ticket Awards for Best Landscaping 16 times, uh, Beautiful Park, the three years that it was awarded. And we have a lot of friends that, that have gone there, like, quite a bit recently. I know you have, but, like, yeah. Kinsey and the guys from Kingdom Cast and everything. Mm -hmm. Had some meetups there, and it's really a gorgeous park, and I was surprised, and we've talked about this off the air as well, with... The Bush is wanting to buy all that property. Were they trying to do something similar to what Disney wanted to do in Florida? Maybe not create a planned community, but did they want a large entertainment complex? Obviously with a hotel and a business park and their brewery. They were definitely thinking about something, but I wonder if there were just too many changes going on. So who knows? But if you've heard anything about maybe some potential Bushcot, could we say that? Sure, why not? Yeah, something like that. Uh, anything about, you know, Bush trying to build other things in that area back in the 70s, let us know. Or if you have thoughts on Bush Gardens Williamsburg, we'd love to hear about them as well. Give us a call on the Communicore Weekly GOAT line at 424-785-4628. That's 424-785-GOAT. He's a nerd. He's a, nerd. He's a, geek. He's a geek. But we all like to hear him speak. So listen up to the words from his speech. Ah. It's George's Book of the Week. This week's book is Magnus Chase and the Gods of Asgard, Book 1, The Sword of Sumner, by Rick Riordan. So I've always been a big fan of the Percy Jackson in the Olympian series, except for the movie. And, you know, the books were a great way to tie history into the more modern age for school kids and adults. So when this book showed up, I was thrilled to review it. So this time, obviously from the title, Riordan takes us into the world of the Norse gods. And this should really attract a lot of attention simply due to the fact that Thor and Loki, of course from the Avengers film, uh, films, are Norse gods and Norse mythology plays a heavy role in the Avengers films. And both Thor and Loki are featured in the Magnus Chase book, but not a lot of spoilers. And you know, I don't think this is a slight against the book that it's slightly different, but there's not a lot about the Avengers in the book itself. And that's sort of what I would expect. <laughs> what? Nothing. Fine. Oh, you're just laughing at the fact just, there are no Avengers in just, this book? Just so in general, George. This in? Okay. Okay. Anyway, so the book does follow a similar pattern to some of Riordan's other series. The main character, like Jeff and myself, we find out that, or he finds out he is a demigod. <laughs> well, we are. We're, you know, podcasting demigods? Sure. Sure. We'll okay, we'll go with that. So, of course, as the book unfolds, we and we follow Magnus on a quest, the action doesn't stop, which is really kind of cool. And right from the get-go, the book grabbed me, and I could see the potential for it, especially with a longer series. So we meet the main character, Magnus Chase, and he's living homeless on the streets as a teen. And right away, he's tossed into an epic battle, which pretty much decides his fate and sets the tone for the rest of the book. And from there, we are introduced to Valhalla and all the other realms of Norse legend. Uh, the author does an amazing job of tying all these together and bringing a more modern take on mythology. And I don't really, we can't really get too involved with the story without giving away too many spoilers, and we do not like spoilers here. But if you did enjoy the other books by Riordan, you're more than likely going to enjoy this one as well. And if you're really interested in North myth mythology, then you're going to find a lot that you're going to like. I did have to look up a few gods occasionally, as you know, well as some places, but it did add a lot to the story. Uh, the author, of course, is somebody that I trust to put down a great story and not mince too many of the historical details, um, which sadly is what you see in a lot of teen fiction. Uh, one thing that surprised me quite a bit, though, was the amount of humor that was in the book. Uh, the author created a great ragtag cast of characters that 
all add to the book overall. And, you know, I did mention Thor at the top of this review. He does come into play, and he's not what you expect at all. He's quite different from Chris Hemsworth, which I don't know how you feel about that. So, anyway, but I loved it. If you have an interest in his books, you need to pick this one up. Or if you like Norse mythology, I think you'll like this one as well. It's Magnus Chase and the Gods of Asgard, book one. You don't know what you know till we know you. You, know, you just don't know. There's one little fact we bet you did it. One little fact we bet you did it. No. The first film made at Disney's Hollywood Studios was Ernest Saves Christmas. Now we know you. Sometimes you might see it, sometimes you don't. Hey, look, what's that? It's a five-legged goat. When you're wandering the Backlot Express at Disney's Hollywood Studios, you can find all sorts of movie memorabilia from eras past. And of course, the most famous there is the stunt vehicle that stood in for betting the cab in Who Framed Roger Rabbit. But that's too easy for a goat. I mean, that's pretty <laughs> obvious. It's right there. So we want to go a little bit deeper. So if you're walking around that little fast food area, you'll find the paint department. And taped to the indoor window there, you'll find call sheets from uh, 1980s television shows uh, such as Cheers and the 1989 film Star Trek V The Final Frontier. Now, while neither one of those actually filmed in the park, they were very popular when the park opened in 1989, which coincidentally was the last <laughs> time the park was popular. I tried not to laugh. I really did. You knew it was coming. <laughs> I knew it was coming. I still tried not to laugh, but you know. Anytime you know, I could dig that knife in. We got to, but you know, seeing as how last week we let everybody know that the year of a million or so limited time cadets had not reached the final frontier, what? and we are continuing it for this year, we want to remind everybody every week we are giving away a prize. One week we're giving it away or having a sponsor, and you sh and we're also having Fairy Godmother Travel sponsor some of the prizes. But to enter the contest, it's not really a contest; it's just a drawing. I keep saying contest. It's, I mean, it's still kind of a contest. It is kind of a contest. When you win, you might. Yeah, you know, it's not a battle. This is not the Hunger Games. Yeah. Thank goodness. Uh, you just need to email communicorweekly at gmail.com with your name, address, and your birthday so we know who to send this wonderful prize pack out this week. And this week is a special Communicor Weekly prize pack. And the winner is Graham C. from Lafayette, Louisiana. Hooray! Yay! Gosh, couldn't even for this year we spring for like crowd enthusiastic no. noises no, no. Okay. Why, why start now george yeah that's a good point because <laughs> we might get more candy you're always stuck into candy God, i just yeah, i'll send you a bag of things. candy <laughs> yeah but it'll be that stuff from the dollar store well it's candy george yeah, that's true it's candy you're not even being though it's very got, specific even though it's got lead in it whatever it's fine whatever that's fine it's not edible it's, mostly or kind it's of. can it's candy that pickles wouldn't eat true my dog would not eat that candy yeah nor so would i, I let him because <laughs> you like the dog because i like the dog <laughs> He doesn't talk back as much. Um, Less than the child. <laughs> yes, before the, this gets any worse, let's end this one. So thank you guys so much for watching and listening to another episode of Communicore Weekly. Yeah, however you get the show, if you are if you get it through iTunes or podcast, you know, leave us a, a rating on iTunes or leave us a comment on YouTube. We'd love to hear from you. Yes, we need a nine-star rating. Yes, we do. And as we mentioned, email us at communicoreweekly at gmail.com to enter the drawing or just to say, yo, 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 what's up? I was going to go with the uh, salt and pepper line, but I decided not to. Not to? Very good. Fair yeah, good. Um, you can also like us on Facebook at facebook.com slash Weekly. And follow us on Twitter and Instagram. I'm at Imaginerding. He's at Jeff Heimbuck. And of course, you can always give us a call on the Communicore Weekly Goat Line at 424-785-4628. And you can visit communicorweekly.spreadshirt.com to get some amazing t-shirts and show your love. And, you know, there's still plenty of time to get you your official cadet membership card or Communicore Weekly stickers. All you got to do is send a self-addressed stamped envelope to Communicore Weekly, P.O. Box 432, Orange, California, 92856. And don't forget to visit patreon.com slash Weekly to help support the greatest online show. For Jeff Heimbuck, I'm George Taylor. And for George Taylor, I'm Jeff Heimbuck. Thanks so much for listening, guys and gals. We'll see you next time on Communicore Weekly, the greatest online show. 